Hi, welcome to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila James Kuehl, your hostess. And uh, today we're bringing you one in an occasional series uh, that I'm very proud of, of interviews with people who have been not only the movers and shakers of our time, but also people who've left their mark on our movement and on our time in history. Um, I'm very, very happy today to welcome David Mixner, who's been an activist for three decades on social justice, civil rights movements, a number of them, as we'll hear, and who, of course, now is a writer. Well, he's always been a writer, but now we all know he's a writer because of his wonderful book, Stranger Among Friends. Uh, if you haven't read it, I'd like you to run out uh, after the show, not right now, and buy it. Welcome, David. Thanks, Sheila. It's nice to be here. I'm so glad you're here. I am, too. Well, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be able to spend a whole hour, in a sense, talking with, uh, with you about you, because I think people read a lot about you and hear a lot about you, and of course, I think you're one of those people that people have said, David Mixner, I have an opinion about him, or I know that he did this, or I know that he did that, but I don't think anyone, until the book came yeah. out, has gotten much of a picture, a full picture. Actually, I've been uh, very successful maintaining a pretty private life. Yes. Uh, while I'm doing public work. And it's, God knows there's never been a shortage of an opinion about me. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And that's good. I mean, dialogue's good. Uh, debate's good. It's healthy. And there's not enough of it. Well, I guess I want to start by asking you, um, if you were to identify a couple of major themes that have run through your life, what would they be? Uh, unbelievable and uh, unshakable determination to live a life of nonviolent deeds and actions, both in uh, words and actions, uh, and on uh, intolerant of injustice, uh, and uh, that uh, no matter what, no matter what the odds, and no matter what the difficulties, and no matter where you're at in your own personal life, uh, good people uh, must speak out against uh, uh, inappropriate behavior by government. But this is a lesson that we learn in a way. It's not a lesson that I think we're born knowing. Um, tell, tell me a little about your, your background. Where, where, well, I grew where up did in, you come from? I grew up in southern New Jersey. Uh, uh, I was probably the last of the generation that uh, didn't get their television set into their low teens. Uh, so the world that we knew uh, came through Life magazine and the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, when Mr. Schaefer delivered it in the 1938 Dodge. Uh -huh. um, my parents, uh, my dad worked on people's farms. He mostly worked on a corporate farm and my mom worked shift work in a glass factory. Uh, and they, had good, they were good folks. Uh, though uh, we were poor, so was the whole community poor. It was a farming community. And it was in the country, so we didn't feel like we deprived and we had nothing to compare it to actually. Uh, except some sort of abstract world out there. And uh, I think the thing that uh, was most determinant in my childhood was the fact that I knew I was different. I knew I was a homosexual from my earliest years. Uh, that isn't surprising me that I had the knowledge. What surprised me was that I knew that I couldn't tell anybody. I'm not sure where I got the information that I couldn't tell my family, my uh, religious institutions, uh, uh, my friends, or anyone in my community, uh, because no one no one talked about the issue where I grew up. But somebody must have talked about it somehow for us to have learned, and I totally identify with this, that there was such a thing, that it had a name even though the names were usually unspeakable or unspoken, and that you could not tell I mean, some information filtered through. Well, I think there was information out there. I mean, uh, when people would get arrested in parks uh, for homosexual activity, gay men, uh, their names would be printed in the newspaper, and they would be whispered uh, conversations between my mother and father about what shame they had brought to their family and to their community. There was a young man who was my age in school who uh, was much more courageous than I or anyone else I knew at that time, uh, who clearly uh, was much more secure with his homosexuality, but he was quite persecuted for it and uh, uh, ended up being sent away to a private school uh, by his, his family to get him out of town to another school mm -hmm. and ended up killing himself at 16. And I remember my family's reaction upon his death. Uh, uh, Dad came in and said, Mary, so-and-so's son killed himself. And, and they sort of said, oh, that's terrible. We've got to take a cake over and, and bake some food to take over to their house. And, and my dad looked at me and said, well, 
you know, they're probably better off that he's dead. And now my father's a good man, you know, and he's not a mean man. He's not a hater. He's not a uh, someone who goes out and get riled up with people who are different. But it was just an, almost an accepted uh, way of life that this young man, who was bright and, and nice and kind, as far as I knew, uh, was better off dead Had than this being terrible, a homosexual. Had this terrible, terrible, tragic flaw. Yes. And how hard for his family, too. How hard for me to hear it, because right. I knew I was just like him. But I meant the, the attitude was... That's right. Not only... I mean, no one... It sounds like no one said, oh, that poor young man, what a tortured young man, he killed himself, but rather... The victim was the parents, not the young man. Mm. The victim was the parents uh, who this young man had shamed and, and, and uh, degraded them in front of their neighbors, in front of their fam friends. Uh, it wasn't him. Uh, he, was, uh, he was almost... Uh, uh, non-existent in most people's mind except as the perpet uh, perpetrator of this horrible deed against his parents. So we have these two threads that are either going to converge or maybe ultimately seem to be the same thing. Um, this sort of hunger for justice that I, I, I only met you probably, what, 15, 20 years ago, <laughs> but it was already there and very yes, strong it, it's, and it, having been expressed and this feeling of shame about who you were, a knowledge of who you were, but this feeling of shame. Where does this justice thread start? The justice thread, I think, uh, started uh, uh, with from the outside world. Uh, I felt shame. I felt that there was nothing I could do. I immediately started changing my dreams, my aspirations for myself, my plans for my life, uh, because I did not think any of the dreams that my friends had at that age uh, uh, would be fulfilled. You know, when the teacher said, does anyone here want to be president? I didn't raise my hand because I knew I couldn't be. Uh, though at that time, it was still a noble goal to aspire to be president when you were a young man. Well, some people still want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll wait for your inauguration. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The, uh, the other thing that was concurrent when I was growing up was the birth of the modern day civil rights movement. It certainly had existed long before my birth, uh, but Little Rock was happening. Uh, the integration, the forced integration of the schools in 1957. Uh, Rosa Parks was refusing to give up her bus seat. Uh, four students were sitting at a lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, and say, I'm not moving uh, until you serve us as blacks uh, and integrate this lunch counter. Uh, and those started to come across in the pages of life and eventually when we got a television. And I was in awe of people who had the courage, who clearly was viewed as different from the rest of society, separate from, and, and who people had strong disapproval, especially in the neighborhood I grew up. Uh, it was a, segregation was a way of life, even in southern New Jersey at that time. And, uh, and they, who had the courage to fight back. Who had the and could do it with dignity, and I was ap absolutely captivated by Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, who gave a philosophy and a reason and a prose and an eloquence and a dignity to to their actions, and uh, I didn't have the courage to fight for myself then. Uh, I didn't have the courage to say who I was, and uh, but I could certainly I knew support their courage. So do you think that's it's interesting because so many members of our community who were not out then and, and many who still aren't out are drawn to, to social justice work. There's this, and it's not just, gee, I think I'm going to be a good person and go do it. Uh, and I, a little projection here, but I always, always, almost felt like I couldn't not do it, not for somebody else, but like there was this driving thing. And I didn't think until we began to talk of how those things were meshed is that what resonated in the civil rights movement? I, to I you? think that, I think not only among gays and lesbians, but I think among Jewish Americans who went down in record numbers, who understood the persecution for being Jewish in this country, who had to change their last names so they could get jobs in the 30s and the 40s, who were denied accommodations themselves in many hotels. I think all of us who have experienced the pangs of bigotry and discrimination. Uh, uh, cannot find it very difficult to remain silent, whether it's done to us or someone else, because we feel the pain, and we know how close it is to us. Well, it's not it's not exactly Forrest Gump, but it looks to me <laughs> in reading your book and knowing you and just knowing I where you've been. I can't run at all. <laughs> but I mean, you have managed to be mm. in 
so many, not managed to be, but volunteered to be in so many of the, the you know, the critical historical movements and moments of our time. And, and it, originally, I think, through a, a, a route that many would see as more political. Tell, tell about that. Well, I sort of accidentally got dropped into the political component. It wasn't my plan, actually. I wanted to be a poet. <laughs> uh, so much for that. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, both John Kennedy and Martin Luther King opened the world to us as young people at that time. Uh, John Kennedy told us we had a responsibility for the planet we lived in, that we should go off to these faraway exotic plans, uh, lands as, as, as youth and, and donate our services to help the poor. Uh, Michael Harrington was writing books about poverty in America and, and opening our eyes to poor children in Appalachia, Native Americans in the Mississippi Delta. It was an extraordinary time where people felt responsible for the kind of planet that we, we lived in. And, and, and thousands and thousands of young people were going south to register uh, black voters, to uh, get arrested in sit-ins and freedom rides and getting beaten, and some even gave their lives uh, to fight for the cause of justice. Uh, the only crime I could think of at that time was to remain silent and not to be a participant in it. And uh, that, uh, quickly my eyes was opened in opposition to the war in Vietnam by Dr. King. Mm -hmm. uh, who said that uh, we could not have select morality, uh, that injustice here in the South was also injustice in Vietnam, and uh, uh, became a very active participant against the war. And in 1968, Senator Eugene McCarthy and, and Senator Kennedy ran as peace candidates against a sitting president. Uh, we were all told that uh, uh, this was unthinkable to criticize a sitting president, that we should remain silent and, 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 and uh, wait until after the election before, before we took the war to the American people. Uh, but what was happening was affecting millions of lives. People were dying and people's lives were being destroyed by this war. And we unseated Lyndon Johnson. And, uh, uh, and at 22, 23, 24 years of age, uh, Young students were running states, uh, were going door-to-door -door canvassing, were becoming press secretaries, uh, and were accepting responsibility for their fate. Uh, I learned very, very strong lesson that uh, people with courage can create great change, and that never to accept the limitations of society who tell you you have no right to speak out, uh, because generally and usually they're wrong. Well, it's true, and I, uh, there's, um, I, a portion in your book when we were talking about a after the uh, the 68 convention in Chicago uh, trying to find a way to to be very honest about how angry we were at Mayor Daley That's um, right. and and a, a sort of a critical moment I thought it was a really good example well you know again when bad things happen people don't want to deal with them you know, it's like the relative who's sitting in the room and everyone's pretending they're not there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the old 600-pound gorilla. Uh, there was enormous brutality in Chicago and bloodshed, and hundreds were arrested, and uh, a number of them were being placed on trial uh, simply to come to Chicago to express their opposition to the war in Vietnam. And I felt very strongly that this had to be made public. Uh, the press had moved on to sexier stories, and uh, the politicians... Uh, issued their words of regret immediately after uh, the incident at Chicago, but had been forgotten. And uh, we, uh, I was very fortunate because of my involvement to be appointed to the McGovern Commission to reform the party. This is the commission that uh, made it mandatory that 50% of women be included in the political process and young people and minorities. And uh, we forget that in 1968, a few white men picked all of the delegates to the convention, Lester Maddox, Mayor Daley, Mayor Barr in Pennsylvania. And the people almost had no say whatsoever uh, until this, the whole process was opened up. And we had a hearing where it was the first time the Democratic Party had returned to Chicago uh, after the 68 bloodbath uh, in Chicago at the convention. and. Uh, uh, Senator McGovern and Senator Stevenson and Senator By did not want me to come to this hearing, even though I was a member of the commission and we had a rule that anyone could attend. Uh, and there was a huge battle in, in the room behind the stage 
uh, with Senator Stevenson pounding the table, demanding that I not be allowed into the hearing room, that because I had every intention of asking Mayor Daley when he appeared before the commission uh, to issue amnesty to all the people he had arrested in an effort and to apologize and to apologize <laughs> for the violence uh, that he was responsible for more than the police, uh, because he was their leader, he provided the tone, he whipped up the fear, he created the tension instead of using his position of authority to heal and to bring people together. And uh, uh, so finally, uh, in an agreement to uh, sort of keep me contained, uh, it seems to have been a problem that has stuck with me all my life. <laughs> uh, in an agreement to keep me contained, uh, George McGovern agreed to ask my question if I promise not to ask any questions at all during the hearing. And I said, this is not important whether I speak. What's important is whether the issue is heard. Uh, so we went out and I kept my agreement. When they came to me, the press was sure that I was going to ask a question. So they came to me and the lights came on and stuff. And I said, I have no questions, sir. And everyone just thought, whoa, what happened to him? <laughs> they sure muzzled him. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Boy, that, that room, back room must have been rough. <laughs> <laughs> and then they came to George McGovern and he said, Mayor Daly, will you... Uh, as a healing gesture, as an attempt to bring people together, which also spoke very highly of George McGovern. Uh, bring people together and issue amnesty for those who are on trial in your city and apologize for the violence and the bloodshed at the convention so we can move forward as a party. Uh, Mayor Daley wasn't thrilled. Uh, he pounded the table and shook his finger at us all and saying, uh, We're, you're destroying the Democratic Party and stomped out of the room. You radical young radical people. Radical people. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, the lesson, though, is, is as much current as it was then. There is this feeling uh, that in election times that we're not supposed to discuss issues. We're not supposed to conduct dialogue around issues. We're not even supposed to disagree. You know, I remember as a child going to the Salem County Courthouse, and there was actually live debates between two candidates outside, uh, an error gone by. And we let them know, the people let them know what was on our mind. The farmers would talk, ask them about crops, and it wasn't any press, it wasn't any lights. It was the people sort of expressing their concerns and arguing with the candidates, you know, as part of the debate, uh, uh, whether mostly about agriculture, but, uh, you know, about other things that were of concern to the people in our community. And it taught, you know, and I have always felt that elections were a time for issues, for discussions, for differences to be aired. should run for uh, <laughs> election at my level. Because that's exactly what happens. Nobody has any respect at all. You know, it's want... the way it should be, <laughs> Sheila. It's exactly right. But we do get to talk about issues. I mean, I remember I, I was opposed to Prop 187, and I had was completely able to explain why. And my district voted for Prop 187, mm -hmm. barely, but, it, you know. But the Perot people wanted to meet with me because they were adamantly pro-187. And we had a wonderful dialogue and ended up actually, you know, fine with each other. I have no idea if they voted for me, but it was, it was the element of debate and discussion that was really important. But you, you have been able to engage in, in these issues and really to shape the issues, sticking for a minute with sort of with the democratic mm -hmm. issues. I know that a lot of people know that you are uh, that you are a friend of Bill's, but I mean an old friend of Bill's. But I don't think many people really know how that first came about and how you met President well, Clinton. We first. met uh, in 1969 after the McCarthy-Kennedy campaigns. Uh, a group of staffers decided, I think, to have like a big chill anti-war reunion <laughs> on Marfa's Vineyard to see where we should go in our opposition to the war, which uh, from those meetings sprung the Vietnam moratorium, the big demonstrations against the war in Vietnam. And... Uh, Taylor Branch, who wrote the book Parting the Waters, and Rick Stearns, who's now a federal judge, asked if they could bring a friend of theirs who they met at Oxford, uh, Bill Clinton, to this meeting. And uh, we all said, sure, fine. Uh, Clinton actually wasn't a very active participant either in the civil rights movement or the anti-war movement. Uh, and uh, he came, and we became pretty close friends real quick. Uh, we had... Uh, we were born three days apart, actually, mm. uh, in 1946. And we both came from small, rural, poor communities. And we were among the few people at that meeting who actually knew people in our classes who had died in Vietnam, 
who, when we went home or expressed our opposition to the war, had to face the mothers and the fathers of our classmates who had died in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and that made us an instant bond, you know, because uh, many of the people in that room were uh, the sons and daughters of Harvard. You know, and uh, and he wasn't. And he wasn't, and I wasn't. Right. And so we became close friends in the sand dunes. Uh, actually, the marshes and the sand dunes of Martha's Vineyard. Was that a problem for you, coming from your sort of your background? Um, I mean, again, a little projection. I grew up working class, mm -hmm. and one of the things I always worried about was, you know, as I started to go and wider circles, uh, there were too many forks and spoons at the table. I didn't know exactly what to do. Did you feel... Oh, yeah, and I developed a persona to deal with my insecurity. It was sort of the good old Dave persona, you know, joking at my own awkwardness, sort of a, a little more classy Gomer pal. You know, I mean, <laughs> golly, we have enough silverware here to fill the whole county. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. uh, and I learned to observe, you know, and, and the... Uh, the other thing that was just critical uh, to opening up the world to me and teaching me how to survive in it was libraries. Mm -hmm. My parents did not have money for books. And my mother and father uh, took me every Saturday to the Woodstown High School Library and the public library and taught me how to read books and so made me check out books. And I think one of the greatest tragedies today in this country is our shutting our libraries. Absolutely. Well, any aspect of public education. Exactly public schools, public libraries. It seems like they're under attack. There must be some anything plan that, or design. E, well, here. exactly. I mean, anything that will make information and access to knowledge available to all people who choose to pursue it uh, is coming under attack. You know, our libraries are closing at 4 o'clock in the afternoon just as the kids get out of school. Uh, we're not putting computers in poor people's uh, neighborhoods so that they uh, can learn and not be computer illiterate by the year 2010 when they have to go into the job market. Uh, young people who are not learning computers today, it's going to be like not learning to read and write. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, they're not going to be able to function in the real world. They're not going to bank, shop, all of the things that are necessary to do by computer. Uh, it is a, it, it's a very appalling trend. You know, it's one thing, David, I've always uh, admired about you, is that you, you're a weaver of themes. Um, you see the relationships between the various movements, uh, and, and they're all about justice for you. The anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the gay-lesbian movement, uh, that kind of integration and the ability to explain it. But alongside of that, in your own personal life, at least early on, because we haven't yet even come to a point where you've talked about being out, there must have been an incredible loneliness. I mean, you're so close to these people. Even the title of your book, Stranger Among Friends. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, uh, my journey as a gay man was a difficult one. Uh, I don't want to portray it as a unique one because, unfortunately, I think there's way too many like mine. Uh, uh, but uh, the first man I fell in love with in college uh, was a fellow athlete at Arizona State University. And about six months after we started going together, we were the first for each other. It was like a Pepsi Dink commercial. <laughs> sweet. And it was sweet, and it was lovely, and it was gentle, and it was kind. Uh, he was killed in an automobile accident. And uh, I was convinced that God was punishing us for what we had done. Uh, I was absolutely convinced that because of what we had done, he had been killed. So for about the next five years, uh, my uh, sexuality consisted of parks, uh, made-up names, made-up backgrounds, lies about who I was, lies about where I worked, anything to s prevent anyone from becoming close to me, from putting themselves in danger, anything so that I would not be disclosed or discovered. Uh, uh, society encouraged lies, encouraged deceit on my part. Uh, then in 1969, after the McCarthy campaign, uh, Four students, myself included, a woman named Marge Glenn Carr, Sam Brown, and David Hawk, uh, formed a thing called the Vietnam Moratorium, which was launching major, massive demonstrations against the war in Vietnam. And it was a very heady experience. I mean, we had covers of Time magazine and Life magazine, and uh, from uh, one office and $320 in March, uh, by November, millions were participating. And we had three floors of a building and staffs of hundreds. And every campus in the country closed down to discuss the war. I mean, uh, no one will ever convince me of our lack of capacity to create change. Uh, I've seen it firsthand. 
And uh, during that period, uh, we had meetings with Nixon, uh, who wanted to know if I believed in God. And I had meetings with Kissinger, who tried to convince me at night that he was a dove, even as he was conducting <laughs> massive bombings during the day. And Ehrlichman, who threatened to throw us in jail with conspiracy indictments unless we stopped protesting against a war, which scared us very much. But I also met another man during that period. Everyone else had someone else. I mean, uh, all of the other coordinators, everyone in the office, especially in the 60s. I mean, oh, this yeah. was the age of hippies and free love and, you know, and, uh, you know, breaking down barriers and exploring new turf. And I would go home alone every night uh, to an empty room and with no one to talk to and no one to share and, and no one to even say I existed, that I existed. And I met this extraordinary man uh, named Frank. Uh, who I fell head over heels in love with, and I trusted him more than anything in the world, and that last year was someone I could even just tell my name. That was a victory, and I didn't, and he knew that I was in the moratorium because of all the press, and so I didn't have to tell him that, I didn't have to lie about that, and he was a Washington bureaucrat, and his apartment was just the most warming, loving, trusting place. It was uh, filled with Yeats and Neruda and Tennyson and Mahler and Beethoven and family pictures and, uh, incense burning and candles and about a month after we met uh, Sheila uh, he said he had to go away uh, for the weekend on business and so as he put on got dressed in the morning and put his uh, plane ticket in his jacket and bent down and kissed me goodbye we agreed to meet uh, the following Monday at the uh, Hilton coffee shop at 16th and K Street and so I uh, very eagerly that morning went uh, afternoon went went to meet him and was greeted by two men in the blue suits. And they sat down at the table and they said, Frank's not coming. And my first reaction, given the experience of my first love of dying, was that Frank had been killed in an accident of some sort. And, and at the same time they did that, they poured on the paper table uh, photographs of Frank and I engaged in sexual activity. Um, there's no way to describe the devastation. No way. Uh, at the time uh, that they put the photographs on the table, they flashed badges. Now, I must say that I wish today I'd had the present of mind to look at the badges carefully and examine them. Uh, my eyes were riveted to the table. Sure. Riveted to the table. I don't know who they were. I don't know if they were official government agencies or, or maybe the beginning of the Gordy Liddy operations for the Nixon administration. Um, I do know uh, that they gave me three days to become an informant on the anti-war movement, which was out of the question. Uh, or they would send these photographs that were on the table to my parents and to the press. Um, they left. Uh, it took me a while to collect myself. In fact, the uh, clerk thought something was wrong and asked if I needed help. And I got outside and I ran to Frank's apartment. I had a key, who had obviously been spending a lot of time there, and opened the door and there was nothing inside. Mm -hmm. There were four white walls, wooden floor, uh, no photographs, no poetry, no music, nothing, not even a dust ball. <laughs> and it was pretty clear I had been set up. And uh, I had decided to kill myself because certainly informing on my peers and, and doing anything to belong in the Vietnam War was out of the question for me. Uh, went on a drug and alcohol binge uh, for three days. Somewhere got the presence of mind. I only can give credit to God because I don't know where it came from, that they probably couldn't send it, that maybe the taxpayers wouldn't be thrilled uh, with their <laughs> money being used this way. Uh -huh. And uh, I went out and they were waiting. And I had made up my mind that if they ever did send it, I would kill myself instantly, if my parents ever said anything. And uh, because at this time, I was well known nationally. Mm -hmm. I could not think of any bigger disgrace. And, and the horror that somehow I might have belonged to war in Vietnam by who I was, was almost more than I could bear. Uh, but I looked him in the eyes and said, send it to him, as if I didn't care. And, uh, um, and then for months, Every time I got a call from mom and dad, I thought they had just gotten the photographs. They never did get sent. Uh, I didn't come out then. Uh, I just lived in fear and terror. And when did you come out? Came out in 1930. Uh, 1930. I you came don't out. mean 1930. <laughs> no, I came out. I got a little shook up by that story. <laughs> well, it is. I, I came I mean, out when I was 30. Uh, I mean, because the... 
I, I'm thinking this must have been an extraordinary act of courage. Everyone's coming out as an act of courage. But considering the punishment that you felt you had, and realistically you had received, um, it's, I mean, it's, it's really a story of, of overcoming adversity in so many arenas. But this one especially, I think, is really exemplary. Yeah, well, like so many people in my generation, Anita Bryant bought us out of the closet. <laughs> As, I think she'd probably be appalled if she heard that statement. I certainly hope so. <laughs> I, I would like to see her appalled. Uh, but she bought us out of the closet. Uh, she started these initiatives in 1976, 1977, the very first initiatives to use the ballot as a way to uh, oppress homosexuals. And it was in Dade County, Miami. And she put it on the, to repeal the sexual orientation clause of the Civil Rights Bill in Dade County. She won two to one there, one two to one in Eugene, one two to one in uh, St. Paul, Wichita. It was sweeping the nation. It didn't look like it could be stopped. And then they went one step further. And in California, they put on Proposition 6, uh, the Briggs Initiative, that would make it against the law for homosexuals to be school teachers. And they had trouble getting anyone to run the campaign against it. It was leading two to one. Uh, they had a, a very distinguished, able man named Don Bradley, a campaign consultant, but they couldn't put, fill out the staff like, uh, because he was viewed as a leader. In fact, many of our own community did not want to oppose it hmm. because they said, well, let's just challenge it in courts. We can't possibly beat it. We can't fight back. Uh, uh, we'll have to come out of the closet. And uh, They came uh, to us several times and asked us to do it, and I just knew that we'd have to come out of the closet. And... Um, my best friend at the time, Peter Scott, said, said we got to do this. And I said, I can't. And he said, if we don't do it, uh, you won't work anyhow. Hmm. You, you know, it will catch up with all of us. Sure. And uh, so through a process of, uh, I finished coming out of the closet. I had told some people previously, I finished the process. And... Uh, and uh, so Anita Bryant bought me out. My coming out, when I first told my family, which was about a year before that, uh, no one politically knew, uh, I had had a nervous breakdown. Uh, my mother and father had a, a terrible time coming to terms with my coming out. Uh, and uh, yelling and weeping and, and uh, uh, banishing me from the house. And, and uh, it was very difficult and very painful. And the combination of all those years of oppression, the blackmail, of death, and of devastation, and finally losing what I thought losing my parents, so eventually they came around, uh, took a toll on me, and I had a breakdown. Then, and I just bounced back from that, and just reestablished myself politically. Uh, then I, uh, like most things I do these days, I not only send a letter to all my political peers. But, you know, I've been. A, very active nationally in politics, but I enclosed an envelope to fight the Briggs Initiative <laughs> when I came out. <laughs> Dear Fred, I know That's you know right. this already, but I wanted to tell you, I'm gay. Please send, send your contribution well, to... It was, it was almost exactly <laughs> well, that bad. I, I know. <laughs> and we raised some good money off of it, actually. Yep. And But almost instantly, uh, people in politics treated me differently. Mm -hmm. The day before... They found out I, they would ask me my advice on foreign policy or domestic policy, especially in relationship to poor people. Uh, they'd ask me about issues of justice. They would ask me to sit on committees uh, to advise senators and congressmen. Uh, the very next day after they found out, I never, no longer was asked. Many progressive Democrats returned checks to me because they didn't want my name on their disclosure forms politically. Uh, after I came out. People who I'd worked with for 10, 12 years. Uh, you know, and, and eventually, over time, Sheila, uh, I have gotten to a place in politics where now they eagerly seek out the support, uh, sometimes, and eagerly seek out the money and the votes, but they still really don't want to deal with us on personal terms, and that's how I got the title Stranger Among Friends. I, as you know, I was very critical of the president on gays and lesbians in the military and went to jail, and a mutual friend of the president and mine who works in the White House. And we both have known this individual for 25 years. And he came to me, he was very upset the fact that I got arrested. Uh, by that time, the president wasn't speaking to me for a while. And uh, he said, how could you do this to us? 
suddenly they were the victims. <laughs> sure. uh, how could you do this to us? We have known you for 25 years. We are your friends. We have been there for you. We walked through your nervous breakdown. We walked through when Peter died. We walked through when you came out of the closet. We are your friends. And that's just the way he said it. And I looked at him and I said, what's the inside of my house look like? And he had no idea. I said, tell me what Peter's funeral was like after he died of AIDS. And he had no idea because he hadn't been there and neither had any of them. I said, tell me if I have children. And he got the shock look on his face and he had no idea if I've even had a family. I said, am I in a relationship now? Do I have a partner? He had no idea. I said, you don't know anything about me. We are political allies, but you have not even taken time to know the very basics about my life. And uh, that's where the title grew out of, Stranger Among Friends. Well, it's, it's so fascinating that, I mean, people who are elementally gay activists, uh, who are wary of electoral politics uh, in great part, um, there can be a sort of great joy about working in that arena. And you have worked in that arena, and you have been a leader in that arena. But much of your heart is in the bridge between that arena, between our movement, and governance, uh, more than that, public policy. Because uh, without the bridge between our community and public policy, we cannot, as a community, live full lives. Because the government, like it or not, is ubiquitous. It has so much to do with us, and I see this every Absolutely. day. So there must always be a place where the door is not open for you, even though uh, mostly, I guess, you're fully embraced in our community, although probably wary about you in the community because of that Political uh, involvement. Yeah, the political involvement. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a little bit of times like a man without a country. Yeah. You know, and that's okay. That's okay. I mean, I've had a very rich, uh, fulfilled life. I mean, I have... David, you're not even 50 yet. Yeah, I know, but I've been a witness to a lot of history and, uh, and, and have been fortunate to, uh, uh, to interact with a lot of participants in that history. Uh, but I've learned something, you know. It was interesting, after President Clinton was elected, uh, everyone assumed that I would go after an appointment or set up a lobbying firm in Washington, D.C. and make a million dollars a year cashing in on all those years in politics with my friend and buddy in the White House. Uh, and that they would all have to come knocking through my door uh, to get approval. Now, Lord knows, I, I had opinions of how I wanted to see this administration proceed and the kind of caliber people like Roberta Actenberg, who I believe uh, should have been allowed to serve and, and talk about courage. Uh, she, she's one courageous individual, what she went through to get confirmed. Uh, uh, but, you know, there's a responsibility that goes along with all of this, you know, and if we expect politicians to act in a responsible way, then we must live our lives the way we want to see the world be. We can't have dual standards. Uh, I deliberately turned down an appointment for a whole set of reasons, but among them uh, was the fact that I didn't want the community to think that I was trading in on all their work, their work, their votes, their money, not mine. I didn't own it. Uh, we immediately set up a transition team in the gay and lesbian community with the heads of all the organizations, NGLTF, HRCF at the time, uh, the Victory Fund, uh, you know, where they processed the candidates for appointment. You know, when they reached an agreement, I helped lobby vigorously for them, like Bob Hattor and Roberta Actenberg and Bruce Lehman. Uh, and the other thing is, is that I decided not to go to Washington up an open office because that's not what I'm about. It's not what I'm about. Uh, I thought that I would probably have to speak out against some of the president's policies. Uh, not as quite as often as I yeah, expected. Right off the bat. <laughs> right off the bat, exactly. Yeah. You know, and, uh, uh, and there was a moment of an incredible euphoria. Uh, we were filled with hope. We didn't really think our friends might have to die of AIDS. We thought that uh, when he said that there is no battle too tough or too strong, that I will not be by your side, that that had taken care of us, that w we had turned a corner. And in many ways, we had. We had jumped light years, if not decades ahead, uh, having witnessed other movements into a position of power and influence in this country and as a major part of the dialogue. 
uh, but we hadn't gotten to the promised land yet. And uh, uh, there was a lot of work to be done and a lot of work to still be done. And so we had a president who sort of really thought he was going to be somewhat messianic and really didn't think he had to show courage or pay a political price because he didn't in the campaign and was just going to do this for us and be revered. And our picture was going to be in his living room, our living rooms for the rest of our lives, right? <laughs> like, like an Appalachian that's family. Right, with John Kennedy, that's exactly. Right. And, uh, um, and we thought that he was going to take care of it for us. You know, and I was, I was somewhat guilty of that. You know, I was somewhat guilty of that. I mean, but, you know, we had lived 12 years of darkness under Reagan and Bush. It was such a contrast. Mm -hmm. It was such a contrast. And it is a contrast. I mean, a man who said, as our friend Kate Clinton, no relation, uh, said, the first president who could ever say the words gay and lesbian exactly. without spitting up. Well, and, and just saying those words were a victory for us at the Absolutely. time. Absolutely. I mean, I remember long meetings how to get candidates just to say the words. That was the issue. No substance, nothing about a cure, nothing about this, just to say the words just to even acknowledge the existence of AIDS. After all, it took Ronald Reagan to 1986, 87, before he acknowledged his existence of AIDS, you know, in his, in his speech. Uh, so we, we were excited. And then we got involved in the military thing, you know, and um, we have a tendency to think on the military, marriage, uh, Colorado, uh, that leaders sit in a room, straight or gay, and pick the issues that we as a society will deal with. You know, and that we have that, I wish we could, <laughs> you know, <laughs> God, I wish we could. Uh, but it's a myth, Sheila. It's a total myth. Uh, it is brave citizens who lead us, and it always has been. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Ministerial Alliance didn't put Rosa Parks on that bus. They didn't even know she was going to work that day. She just refused to get up, and they ran to catch up with her courage. Roy Wilkins and Whitney Young and Shirley Chisholm and Barbara Jordan didn't tell those four students in Greensboro, North Carolina, to sit at that lunch counter. They just did because they were no longer willing to live in a segregated society. And the leaders ran to catch up with their courage. It's true, but there were organizations. I mean, people think Rosa Parks was some kind of housewife that got on the bus one day and was tired. Mm. And that's not exactly right. It's not right true either. at all. She was extremely active in her community. Right. And, uh, and, and, uh, and it was part of a time of rising expectations. But I, I do hear what you're saying. I mean, these, the, the, the heroes often of the time, the people who really lead are often the people who touch someone's hearts, you know, the real heroes. But they don't have to do it every day. That's right. And leaders really do. That's right. And well, people who govern really do. And it is messy. Well, you know what they say. Yeah, there's two things you never want to watch being made, sausage and law. <laughs> and, and public policy is a very messy thing. It kind of happens accidentally. Right. And what you're saying is nobody plans this stuff. No one plans it. I mean, the, uh, in the euphoria of the election, the Clinton staff were more concerned about who was going to be White House Chief of Staff than any issues. They were on top of the world, as well as they should be. It was an extraordinary moment and an extraordinary accomplishment on their part. Uh, but no one wanted to deal with the gay issue. In fact, they were a little taken back what an integral part we played in that election. Mm -hmm. One out of every seven votes for Bill Clinton was a gay or lesbian vote. Mm -hmm. Over three and a half million out of 20 million raised for the DNC was gay and lesbian money. And so suddenly they didn't want to look too beholden to us. Mm -hmm. you know? So there was a little bit of a plantation mentality that set in and they said, we'll take care of you. It's just don't be too visible, don't make too much noise. And uh, we were new to this process. We have never even before in our history as a community been invited into a transition process, ever. So we were le learning the new rules and the new games just as much as many of them were. And because the president hadn't felt any backlash during the campaign when he talked about the military, uh, when uh, young Ensign Keith Meinhold's case came down, he was asked about it at a press conference. He had no briefing. He hadn't notified the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He hadn't notified the head of the Armed Forces Committee. He just said, yeah, I plan to sign it. Uh, I don't think he had any idea that the reaction that would come from it. And it was instantaneous, because as you know, Sheila, there's a difference between the rhetoric of a campaign and the reality of putting it together when you're in office. And, and we were off to the races. The genie was out of the bottle. And no matter how many of us would have liked to put it back in and say, give us time, let's do it right, let's go brief the Joint Chiefs, let's get our community ready. 
Uh, we, we, history doesn't give us that luxury. And the press doesn't give you that luxury either. Absolutely I mean, I never not. have so many microphones shoved in my face in my life as when the right wing has brought these uh, uh, bills to bar the recognition of gay marriage that would be legal in other states, which of course isn't even happening anywhere yet. Just like Anita Bryant, however, it's often our enemies that drag us even more into the spotlight, and once there we go, well, let's just talk about it, and we turn out to be quite articulate, and rising expectations go up again. I mean, I would have settled happily for domestic partnership legislation last year, and this year I say, what are you handing me the second class stuff for? You know, oh, let's talk about marriage. And people who said domestic partnership was the worst thing that would ever happen to the nation are now advocating it as a way to avoid marriage. Side. Exactly. That's right. Well, why don't we give them three exactly. or four things and then they won't ask but for But the only crime is not to fight back. That's the only right. crime is to remain silent, and the only crime is not to fight and deal with the hand that history has dealt you. And the fact of the matter is, six months ago, over 70, 80 percent of the people of this country opposed same-sex union. And the latest poll had it at 58 percent. Under political terms, that's an extraordinary job. Uh, we are educating the American people. We are eradicating the myths. Uh, we are building bridges. Uh, we are creating knowledge. And it is the opportunity to do it now. Uh, not next year, not two years. We can't close our eyes and hope that it will go away and it will come back on our own terms. Uh, that lawsuit was fired, uh, filed by two courageous couples, a gay male couple and a lesbian couple in Hawaii, just like that lunch counter, because they didn't want to live this way anymore. Right, and they didn't check with us, did they? They didn't check with us. They didn't tell <laughs> They just were not going to live with indignity any longer. And we're running to catch up with their courage. It's true. It is true. You know, the, the interweaving of themes also in, in your life and your sense of justice seems to have come together pretty um, powerfully in your work on the Holocaust Museum. Will you say a little about that? Well, you know, I mean, I think that, uh, again, it, 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 there's two uh, things that are important to understand. Our responsibility to remember and learn from history. When we think that so-and-so would never do that, or such-and-such such could never happen in this society, uh, we only look back, need to look back to history when good people were saying the same things in Nazi Germany in the 1930s to understand that society is capable of great evil if good people remain silent. Uh, and so th from that perspective, the work of the Holocaust Museum is essential to us as a society. Uh, hundreds of thousands of school children go through that museum every year. For many, especially given the uh, textbook censorship that's going on in some states, it is their only exposure to real information about the Holocaust when they go on that school trip to Washington. I think it is one of our most important national monuments. And the other thing is it's important for us as gay and lesbians to reach out to all communities. Whether it's the Jewish community, we're raising $2 million uh, to support the work of that museum, and they, in return, are establishing an endowment for the study of gays and lesbians in the Holocaust. Uh, uh, or the welfare bill uh, for poor people, or African Americans on affirmative action and defeating CCRI here in the state. Well, I, I think that's a lesson that you um, have, have really taught by the way you've lived. I mean, the, uh, your, your idea of the Great Peace March, um, which, as we both know, didn't turn out exactly the way you planned it. But still, uh, the, the notion that people, ordinary people, would walk across the country to demonstrate, to witness, really, in the, you know, in the, in the religious sense, um, how they would stand for peace. It was a magnificent undertaking. Uh, you described some of the failure of it having to do with your own hubris. Yeah. I, uh, but but I, I think it's important to acknowledge that. You see, I think that uh, we code over too many of our own weaknesses, and we code over failure as if that that is a terrible word. Failure in the pursuit of good things uh, is bound to happen if you keep at it long enough. <laughs> you know, I don't know of an individual in their life who in some form or another hasn't experienced failure. Uh, the Great Peace March and the things that did not go right with it was my responsibility. It's important for people to hear that, that I'm not afraid to say it. It was my responsibility. And some of it happened because of decisions I made that were just incorrect politically. Some of it happened because of my ego. And some of it happened because of events outside my control. Uh, but it was important not to gloss it over, you know, because it is important for young people to know that they will be setbacks. They will be difficulties. 
There will be times where it seems like we'll never move forward, you know. And if you keep at it, and if you don't let those moments, those dark moments, hold you down and people tell you that you no longer can participate, uh, you can go ahead and create great change. You know, Paul Simon has a song, the title is, uh, You Gotta Learn How to Fall Before You Learn to Fly. Exactly. And I think one of the lessons, too, because I see you as a great risk taker in your life. Now, there are times when you would say, no, 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 I didn't act courageously or whatever, but overall, looking at this, this 50 years, the first 50, shall we say, <laughs> oh, um, please, not a real 50 risk taking, more. <laughs> and you have taken them, but you continue to take them. Why? Because when you fail, you fail. I mean, it's one of the interesting things that you learn is that you're hurt, you, it, something could have gone terribly wrong, but you ain't dead yet. And you really have to go on and, and take the next risk. Well, there's even more important points. There's a lot of people who can't take risk at all because of their status in society. Uh, they are so discriminated against, are so poor, are so excluded, and so oppressed that for those of us who still have voice of any stature whatsoever, to remain silent as we're licking our wounds and feeling sorry for ourselves, dishonor all of them, our silence. So it what? is criminal for us to remain silent. Uh, yes, it was painful. It is still painful for me to talk about the pro-peace march. I, it, it was difficult time for me. Uh, it was good intentions, but it didn't work out for a whole lot of reasons. There was a very courageous story that took place on that of the marchers who came out of the collapse and with sheer determination on their own made it across the country. There is an enormously courageous story about their effort and, and, their, and their epic journey across the country. Uh, again, a wonderful story of out of the ashes to Phoenix arising. Uh, but for me to... Uh, to mope around, to be the victim uh, because I'm in pain, because it didn't work out the way I had hoped, because I'm not popular anymore. Uh, you know, this whole thing about being popular and liked uh, would have been an unconscionable act when there's children dying of lead poisoning, when there's children not being fed, when our school lunch programs are being cut back, when gays and lesbians are being beaten up on the streets, uh, when people are dying of AIDS. Uh, how could I possibly sit on the sidelines? Is there anything that would keep you from speaking up these days? No, nothing. I, you know, uh, Sheila, in many ways, AIDS have liberated me. I have lost 258 friends to AIDS. 85% of the gay men I was struggling with in 1980 are dead. At one time, I looked at the president when we were having a meeting in the office, and I said, you don't have anything I want except freedom and a cure. I said, I don't want an appointment. I've seen the inside of Air Force One. I've been upstairs in the White House, and some of my friends have better China than you do. <laughs> you know? I said, just, I don't have anything left to lose. When I put Peter Scott away, when he died, uh, suddenly I became free. There was like nothing left to lose, and truly nothing left to lose, except our dignity and our integrity and our freedom. And I wasn't about to give it to him. Well, it looks like your book is going to do really well. If I, if I can, I mean, if it looks to me, walking in the bookstore, <laughs> like it's do, going to do great. And certainly it's, it's well-reviewed and uh, well thought of, and everybody I know is reading or has read it. Um, and I know that there's never just one book in a person. Um, what's next for you, David? Or what, what things are next? Because I know there's never one thing on your plate. One of the things I uh, saw uh, and have learned from this community uh, that I'm a part of the gay and lesbian community is extraordinary courage over the last years and the process of coming out and fat, uh, fighting AIDS, fighting for choice. Uh, ordinary citizens are rising to extraordinary heights, uh, accepting incredible responsibility against insurmountable odds. And so I'm going to write a book, a second book about that, The Ordinary Citizens and the Power to Create Great Change. Well, I guess we, we've got maybe two and a half minutes uh, <laughs> left, if I, if I judge right. What would you say, uh, we have an audience all around the country now, and I don't think it's just lesbian gay people, though my hunch would be primarily. Um, after this so far long life of activism, of commitment, of really unwavering love of justice, what would you say to the people, especially young people, watching you right now? I'm saying that we're at a turning point. 
I think that the passage of the welfare bill was a wake-up call for all of those who love justice and believe in progressive and liberal politics. If we can pass a piece of legislation that puts a million children into poverty and have it signed and not a peep be uttered, uh, then something is seriously wrong. And just like in 1968, when older America remained silent as their sons and daughters were being shipped to Vietnam and it was the youth of the world who woke us up, uh, I think it's their turn. I think they have to save our children, save the poor, and once again awaken our conscience to the, to the problems of this nation. And what if they're saying to themselves, what's that got to do with me? Well, it's got everything to do with you because if you walk down the street and don't feel safe, it's most likely you don't feel safe because of drug abuse or poverty. Uh, if your taxes are going too high and going down the drain, it's most likely they're going too high because they're not being spent wisely and it's not, we're not planning for the future. We're trying to do patchwork. Uh, if you can't swim in the river because it's polluted, it's because no one's doing anything about it. It has everything to do with you. It's the whole quality of life. You cannot build enough gated communities to protect yourself from the world you live in. It is our world and it's our neighbors and we're either going to accept responsibility for it or we're not. David Mixner. Thank you very much. This has been great. The quickest hour I think I've ever spent <laughs> in my life. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, the theme of our show is, of course, that there's so many of us now who have said, this is who I am, this is who I truly am. Now I'm free to say it. And what we want to say to the rest of the world is, get used to it. Thanks for joining us.